Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Jennifer Steinhauer, Senior Director here at the Institute of Politics, and welcome to this evening's event, Journalists on the Front Lines, A Year of War and Conflict, featuring the well-known Israeli journalist Noga Tarnopolsky, who has covered the region for two decades, and Los Angeles Times foreign correspondent and Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer Marcus Yam. This conversation will be moderated by New York Times opinion columnist and former foreign correspondent Lydia Polgreen. Of the scores of events that the Institute of Politics stands up each academic year, I confess that centering journalists is my favorite. Every April, we bring some of the best reporters from around the United States and around the world to talk about their profession in an event dedicated to the memory of David Broder, a titan of journalism whose career began here at the University of Chicago, where he earned his bachelor's degree in 1947 and a master's in 1951. Known for his ability to cut through the noise of punditry, Broder for the Washington Post framed his campaign coverage by looking beyond the political machine, turning public attention to voters whose voices might otherwise be drowned out. He passed away in 2011, having established a legacy of integrity and professionalism. And the IOP is very proud to know the Broder family as both benefactors of this event and friends. In recent years, this dinner conversation has appropriately shifted away from celebrating great political coverage to focusing on the urgent issues of the safety of journalists, hundreds of whom have been killed, injured, kidnapped, or silenced in their effort to maintain a free and open press, a cornerstone of our democracy. You will notice on our stage tonight an empty chair. This represents the loss of scores of journalists from Gaza and their families since, that war, since the war began there in October. The cost to that community of journalists has already been too hard to bear. Here in the United States, the threat has largely been created through the decline of local journalism, made so by avarice and other factors, and we hope deeply to see local journalism repaired in this country. Rebuilding a vibrant local ecosystem and upholding all press freedoms will forever be a cornerstone of the mission here at the IOP. So we thank you all for being here and your interest in journalism. Now please welcome to the stage Noga Tarnopolsky, Marcus Yam, and my friend and former colleague, Lydia Polgreen. Well, that, that music feels appropriate um, because both of, <coughs> both of my, um, my, my very esteemed colleagues here have been under tremendous pressure doing very tough work under not so easy circumstances um, in, uh, in Israel um, and in the West Bank and I'm sure would very much like to be able to go to <laughs> Gaza, although no one is able to at the moment. Um, but let's, let's start with, with the most immediate. I mean, um, Marcus, you just landed back from, um, from uh, uh, Jerusalem via, via Doha, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could just start by talking a little bit about um, what um, Sort of what you've been seeing, how you've been working, what's the uh, what's the feeling on the um, on the ground, and how have you been operating? Uh, I'll start off by saying I was in eastern Mexico when the war broke out, <laughs> and I was given like 24 hours to get to Israel, and I arrived October 9th. Um, you know, early hours of October 9th, couldn't fly in. I booked like four separate plane tickets, and all they were all canceled. Um, had to cross by land, land in Jordan walked over, and ever since then, it's been a whirlwind from, you know, the first couple of days, we just hop, hopped in a rental car, drove me south as close as we can to Gaza to see what we can, and obviously it's a mess. I mean, Noga, you've probably seen it too. Um, they haven't even cleaned it up. There were body bags everywhere. Uh, still, the carnage is still very, very visible. Bodies not in bags also. Bodies not in bags also. Um, <clears throat> and I would also say that um, covering some of that, covering a little bit of like the news and uh, the war in, in Tel Aviv, in, in Jerusalem, and then also then, then came the, the moment when we thought we would get to go into Gaza, but then really not. And, mm -hmm. and we haven't been able to get into Gaza unless you were invited by the IDF into one of their like embeds, mm -hmm. uh, which we haven't even gotten an invite for. Other publications have been invited. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of forced me to really explore the West Bank. 
uh, an area which I don't really have any experience in, mm -hmm. and I've had to like just go up and down, just covering covering the news there, um, uh, and also covering what's going on on this, you know, the Israeli side from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Noga, what, walk us through what your life has been like for the past six months. I mean, first of all, what was that, what was that morning like? Um, so I brought I something. I want you to hear what woke me up very early in the morning. I was in Jerusalem of the 7th of October. Let's see if we can hear it. Um, so it was this bright, sunny day, and I had, you know, initially, in the first few seconds, no idea what was happening, and pretty quickly I realized it was something of a magnitude that we had not previously contemplated, in part because um, there was so little news. On the normal channels, switching on Israeli radios, uh, trying to get information from official government channel, channels, there was almost no news, and it was mysterious. Like, had they all been hit? Was there a viral attack, you know, um, cyber attack? It took a little while to grasp that the country had been caught so completely unprepared, and that at, let's say, 8 a.m., when I was beginning to make these phone calls and trying to understand what was happening, I could call friends and people I knew in the South, but they couldn't really speak. And it did take a while to realize these people were under assault, hiding, and couldn't answer phones. And the authorities had little to no idea what was happening. And so that kind of attack was not something I had contemplated. And in a different way, I was prepared for some major disaster to happen because there had been warning after warning after warning from all kinds of military and intelligence authorities to the government that Israeli defenses um, were not in a good place, that Israeli deterrence had been badly damaged by the government's efforts to perpetrate a sort of coup d'etat. And what I had expected was to hear news of a catastrophe that was born out of a constitutional crisis. I expected people would be dead. I expected there would be chaos. So I was steeled for that, but I didn't know the details. Mm. Um, and it didn't take long. The, the lack of precise news within two or three hours made it clear to me that we were talking about at least many hundreds of dead, that, you know, that the, the magnitude of this was massive. Yeah. So you're waking up at home. Marcus, you're in in Mexico and sniffing frantically the vanilla. <laughs> sniffing the yeah. vanilla and 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 you know um, making making frantic plans to travel. Um, in that moment, wh what you know? How do you think about you know? No, obviously you're waking up as both just a, a person living in a place, right? Suddenly thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't actually know what's going on and trying to reach, you know, people around you. Marcus, you land and you're, you're, you're a journalist and you need to sort of immediately snap into that yeah. mode. What's your first move? I mean, you, you know, you described sort of driving to the South, but it, it kind of paint a picture for us and then, and then maybe we can look at some of your photos as well of mm -hmm. like, what, what, is, what is that experience like? And, and what are the, you know, sort of what are the first things that you do when you land in a situation like that to try and, 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 and wrap your head around, like, what's the story I'm going to tell here? Uh, first of all, I'd say, as you know, this job is 90% logistics, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm in Mexico. I don't have half my things. I'm there on a, a fluff assignment doing a story about the vanilla industry. <laughs> um, barely have enough clothes. Um, I'm thinking... And you probably don't have your Kevlar vests, you know, no, helmets, things like that. No, that you so really I have to... literally have to figure out where my things are. I mean, I, I, luckily for me, I've been on the road for living on the road for five years, and I've, like, deposited things in different parts of the world. <laughs> and so I figured out, like, all right, I have a set PPE in New York, I have one in Lebanon, and I have one in Kabul, and I have one in Seoul. So, like... How can I get one of them shipped to me and I can intercept it? Mm -hmm. 
So I arranged that, intercept my, my gear in Jordan, and then from there, head in. And as somebody who covers breaking news, and I'm somebody who they call a parachute journalist, mm -hmm. by, by definition, right? Then the only thing you have to, that I'm worried about is getting to the heart of it as fast as possible. Because once you wait a few, like a certain amount of time, access closes down. You know, I think it, access is, I mean, what I've learned in previous, covering previous wars and conflicts is that in the beginning, the first like 72 hours, the first 96 hours is it, when it's the most chaotic is when mm -hmm. you definitely get to like cut through everything and get in as fast as possible and, as, and get to the, you know, get past a lot of roadblocks, get past a lot of security checkpoints. So that's why when me and my colleague, Nabi Bulos, uh, the Middle East Bureau Chief, and I crossed over from Jordan, we had in mind we were going to drive as close as possible to see what we can see. We, obviously, we were pretty certain we're not going to get into Gaza. Um, that'd be a fluke if we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but we wanted to just get in, and we just drove in. And, and obviously, the military was still very confused in that moment. Like in that, on, on October 9th, they were like, they had no clue who's who, you know, and you can see bodies everywhere. Um, and, and they were just, weren't even asking questions. They were just busy securing the, that perimeter, mm -hmm. you know, didn't care. And, 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 and by the end of that week, like we were going to the kibbutz, all the different places where the attacks happened. And even in there, they were so un disorganized to the point where at one point I was in kibbutz Beri and I was, I'd lost the tour that had the tour of journalists that had taken everybody through and I lost them. I couldn't find my group and I, my GPS wasn't working. I couldn't even figure my way out with Google Maps. And yeah. it's like a little like, what was it? A big subdivision, right? Uh, the, big, the, kibbutz. The, kib the kibbutz is, uh, I would say- a, How do you describe a, it? A village. Yeah, a village. It's a very large subdivision. Mm -hmm. And my GPS wasn't working. GPS has been disabled. It's not right. that it wasn't working. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I just can't figure it out. Like, are you in a car or are you? No, I was walking you inside walking. the kibbutz. Oh, and right. I was like, I can't figure out my way out of this big subdivision. And right. Well, they like, could look like a campus. So it does, paths yeah. paths and not everything has, you know, is you can drive in a car and you have to know your way around. And obviously this is a place of carnage. Like, you know, there's been like tank fire, like rocket fire, like houses are destroyed, burnt down, like bodies in some parts. And, and I keep, keep making the wrong turn and I keep ending up in the same place. And I'm just like, I'm lost. I'm officially inside this like, this- this Charnel house, basically. Yeah, like this yeah. haunted place, basically yeah. on my own for hours. And then by come sundown, I was able to find my way out. Wow. You know, I found my way to the gate and the soldiers were like, I can't believe you're still here. There's still a journalist here. Huh. And it shows you how disorganized the army was even back then. Wow, wow. Um, but anyways, the, um, ah, I see something on the screen now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, they were in the beginning there, the, uh, even like, the, uh, we were driving around, we can like wander freely. The army was like, it was so confused. And, and, and I was able to like, even like hang out in one evening with the tank division. Wow. Like in the very beginning at the board, right on the border of Gaza, they were like, what are you doing? I was like, taking pictures of sunset. They were like, go for it. Huh. You know, and these guys were prepping to this, like, go in, basically, just mm -hmm. roll on in. Um, and I think one of the things I've learned as, as doing this work is that you really, really have to be quick in the first couple of days and just like get everything. And then from there, retreat backwards as access closes down and do what you can. I mean, in... Um, I, I take my experience from like in Ukraine, for example, mm -hmm. the first month of that war was mayhem. It was just like, there were no, there were no rules. They even had, didn't have a press card yet, system yet, mm -hmm. proper press card system. And all you, you show, I showed my company ID, that's it. Yeah. And they were like, okay, whatever, just go on through. And Sometimes I've just shown a business card. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, in the Ukraine war, we, at some point, they were letting us go into places where soldiers don't even go. At some point, we were charting out where the bleeding edge was. Hmm. You know, we were like, okay, the Russians are only 100 meters away. Let's turn around now, mm. Mm. you know? So that was what it felt like covering that, that war. Mm. Um, and, and, and I would say that, like, it's not something I take lightly, but... 
it's something you learn over time to trust your instincts, go in, uh, move as fast as possible, um, and then from there just figure out what, else, what, bigger, what the bigger picture is. So mm -hmm. cover the breaking news first, step back, and then cover the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. um, Noga, talk to me about what, you, what your initial, I mean, because there must have been a moment where you're just thinking, my God, who do I know? Who's safe? Am I, you know, you're just really thinking about, you know, kind of as a, as a person. But then eventually your, your journalistic instinct also kicks in, um, or maybe they're simultaneous for you. My um, journalistic instinct kicked in the, the minute I was awakened you know, yeah. like the first thing I did was put my hand up with my phone and record mm -hmm. the um, it was, and the air raid siren. In Jerusalem, it's fairly unusual. They had them again Saturday night. Um, so I had a very different situation, um, of course, than Marcus, because I'm on site. And many media uh, who I've worked for in the past or who follow me knew I was on site or mm -hmm. assumed. So I started getting phone calls within minutes. Um, when I was started, so for radios, for TVs, within an hour and a half or so, there was a crew on my balcony. Wow. And we were broadcasting uh, to Latin America, to Spain, to France, to London, all kinds of things. And my main um, activity, at least in the first, in the first 48 hours, I felt like I was a filter. And that, so I, from my balcony, you have this unique view of the whole Judean desert, and you can see the, um, the golden top, right, the Dome of the Rock. And so there was no doubt about where I was, and I kept trying to slow everyone down and, and saying, we don't know. And many, I remember many times saying, it's gonna be a lot worse than what we know right now, it was clear. In the first few hours, it was unclear, for example, what was even happening to me what was happening in Tel Aviv. There were, the assault was so massive, the number of missiles and rockets launched was so massive that people in Tel Aviv were all um, in bomb shelters and it was unclear if there had been hits. There were a few. Um, and then the nature of the attack in the south of the country was intellectually difficult to grasp. It was as if you live in a building it, there was a big feeling of in reality. So you live in a 14-story building, and some, something unexpected happens, and suddenly you're living in a seven-story building. So hmm. there's a period of time that can be minutes or hours or days where you just feel disoriented. So the reality that the Israeli borders had simply melted away. There was no border security. The other thing was not only a weekend, but it was a Jewish holiday. So it was a long weekend. So a lot of people were, in, were on vacation. Many of the people who were taken hostage didn't actually live in these kibbutzim or they were on vacation. They were visiting grandparents, family, friends. A lot of people had gone, gone together as friends to this um, music festival. It was a long weekend type music festival that's now become uh, well known. So there was a, this kind of feeling of chaos. And I, so I remember, I, I mean, hundreds of times in those first two days, saying, um, you know, more than a thousand dead, we don't know, mm -hmm. saying it's still ongoing. That first day I must have said that line, I mean really a hundred times, over and over, because it was clear that there was an assault ongoing and that there was no control over the borders, that entire communities were being ravaged. There's one kibbutz near Oz where I did a lot of work in the past that lost 25% of its members to murder or kidnap. Mm -hmm. So it was very chaotic and I, my way of coping was very professional and very much trying to make sure I was delimiting what we really knew and what we didn't yet know. And now I'm remembering things, for example, the prime minister of the country didn't address the people for something like 18 hours. And when he did, it was a pre-recorded, crappily made video. And so by that point, I was in the night of the 7th, between the 7th and the 8th, and it was clear to me that he, he and the government were not capable of actually um, being honest with the people. 
about what had happened. Well, and, and, and what you had spent your time focused on and what your coverage had really been focused on, I mean, you, you wrote at one point that, you know, before October 7th, you know, Israel had been through, you know, one, one of the worst years in memory. You know, this was a country in deep, deep, deep crisis. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how you make that pivot from sort of political crisis where you're, you know, you're sort of covering, you know, a huge protest movement and that to, you know, kind of becoming a sort of war correspondent? Um, it didn't feel to me like that much of a pivot. It it's felt like a yeah. continuation of the emergency. Mm. The situation um, in Israel before the, this attack was really bad. And it felt insecure, physically insecure. I, even before, even during the pandemic, when the Israeli protest movement, that was at that time it was called the Black Flag Movement, first arose, when Netanyahu made his first effort to steal the power of the state and use the pandemic to cover it, um, and he shuttered the parliament for two days illegally, it failed, but it was a wake-up signal. To me, it was a very clear wake-up signal of what he was really trying to do. And so I kind of had my eye on this stuff. And for example, you could feel um, in the way police operated at the edges of the protests. Here we're seeing some images. The way it was changing over the passing months and how it was becoming less controlled, more and more um, violent, more and more arbitrary. So I felt steeled somehow. Hmm. I, I was as shocked, on, on a certain level, I was absolutely as shocked as everybody. I was shocked, certain things over time shocked me. The fact that the borders were so completely and totally unprotected, I had to, you know, glob onto that. But, I, I was not shocked that a huge disaster had happened. I, I was absolutely steeled for that. It was clear to me the country was on a very bad course. Mm -hmm. I'd been writing about it. Um, but you know, there were scenes that you just don't really expect to see, right? Incinerated mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't need to continue, but there were really scenes yeah. that uh, you don't expect, I didn't expect I would see in my lifetime. Yeah, I mean, as, as writers, um, um, you know, we, we can describe things um, and, and, you know, we sort, of, we sort of do our best to capture. But, and Marcus, you, you write and, and you also, you also take, take photographs. Um, how do you think about um, approaching um, a scene like, like the one that you described in, 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 the, um, in the kibbutzim that, that, that you went to? And how do you think about sensitively capturing, um, you know, kind of what you're seeing and, um, you know, balancing the sort of dignity of the people involved with the, the desire to give a, you know, accurate reflection of what's happening? I mean, very carefully. Mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, it's very difficult. I mean, I've made, there are pictures that I've made that I feel like I can't even publish just because it's mm. just too gory mm -hmm. sometimes. I mean, like, I, I mean, how many pictures of like corpses do you need mm -hmm. uh, before it becomes like I don't know, gratuitous, right? Um, so it's very, very difficult in that sense. I feel like uh, I'm just going to go to like the picture. It's like, it's a picture here I'm oh, looking you're for. Controlling. Yeah, okay. I'm looking for one here. Um, from yeah, right here. Like, you know, this is like from that first day when I arrived mm. and we're just driving by and then you see like on the side of the road, like, you know, mm. corpses around like, instead of like walking up to it, you know, and just taking a picture of the corpses, how can I better frame this, right? Mm -hmm. So I waited there for like, maybe like as long as I could before I get, got chased away by the army to like wait for some vehicle to pass me, a tow truck pass with like all the destroyed vehicle. Then I was like, all right, this is the way I framed this. I don't have to make the bodies, the gore mm -hmm. front and center. Mm -hmm. Like otherwise, I mean, we work in the newspaper business. We're, we don't usually, don't normally show bodies mm -hmm. as a rule, um, yeah. unless it's newsworthy enough. And I feel like I have to keep that in mind too. Like we have readers who cannot, American readers who cannot stomach 
you know, the and, violence. And there are arguments about, you know, sort of desensitization, that if you, you know, are constantly seeing violent images that, that you become sort of inured to them. Um, but yeah, no, go, go ahead, yeah. I have, I actually haven't discussed this with you. I, I have very mixed feelings about this question mm -hmm. because I also think it's part of our job to show these horrors. Mm -hmm. And if part of what news delivery is, is photographic, I think that's also, so I, for me it's not a simple mm -hmm. um, thing. And I just wanted to point out that last week, if I'm not mistaken, just a few days ago, an AP picture received uh, this prize of picture of the year. Yeah, and there was some controversy about it, which I'm thinking yes, you're gonna talk about. Yeah. Well, I wanna mention it because there were, you know, all of these perpetual uh, cyber complainers. Mm -hmm. um, Could you just quickly let people know what the photo was? And, yeah, yeah, that's it. So the picture that won this award was a picture by a Palestinian photographer, if I'm not mistaken, of a young Israeli festival goer, uh, obviously a young woman wearing um, shorts or a mini skirt, and she's, her body is so damaged it's distorted. Mm. And she's been pulled across the flatbed of a, a van, and she's surrounded by terrorists, armed men um, displaying their trophy. Mm. You don't see her face, but you see her broken body. It's unclear if she's dead or alive. And this was one of the pictures that was a signal picture of that day, of October 7th. It's important to remember also that this particular terror attack had the bizarreness or the newness that it was um, filmed and photographed and displayed live by the people perpetrating it. The Hamas forces that invaded Israel right. had GoPro cameras, and this was being broadcast. Mm -hmm. And moreover, on the Facebook pages of many of the victims, their phones were taken by the terrorists, Facebook, the Facebook app opened. There is a famous case of people, I don't know why I'm laughing, one woman, young woman, discovering that her grandmother was murdered because it was broadcast live on her, the grandma's own page. Facebook page. So, the whole question of photography has been, I think, not sufficiently analyzed and studied yet. Mm. But this Palestinian photographer was accused by people who call themselves pro-Israel of being a terrorist himself. To my knowledge, with zero evidence, mm. but just because he was there and he covered it and it was at this crucial moment. And um, again, people referring to themselves as pro-Israel complained that the picture was um, an abuse towards this young woman yeah. who initially uh, was listed among the kidnapped, the Israeli hostages, and eventually was listed among the dead, though her body has never been returned. Mm. She's one of those cases. And then her dad was interviewed on Israeli radio, mm. and her dad was in tears, and he said, it's one of the most important pictures of the year. Everyone should see it. And I thought, you know, I thought his words were so moving. Mm. First of all, as a testament to the importance of what we do to transmit these. Imagine, and I was thinking, imagine if this picture were not being um, prized, were not recognized for its importance, mm. right? What should the complaint then be, right? Are we trying to conceal what happened? And I thought his words were extremely moving. I'm not a gory person and I'm not arguing for gore but I am arguing for the value of transmitting the news, and in this case, photographic news. And I thought he felt validated. Mm. The horror he has lived through, the loss of his child, he felt validated by the fact that this photographer's picture was being recognized in that way. And I found that really yeah. validating for me. It was really, really remarkable. Um, in in those moments, so so you know, you sort of go to the you go to the um, to the to the the southern border. You're reporting, reporting, reporting. Um, Marcus, I'm guessing your mind is quickly moving to okay. Next stage is almost certainly going to be. Um, I mean, both of you are thinking this. Almost certainly going to be some kind of military action in Gaza. Mm -hmm. What then? Are you thinking? How do I? 
how do you position yourself? What do you do in order to, to kind of continue covering the story? I mean, there's no access to Gaza. I mean, and it is extremely difficult to cover this war without getting access to the most important part of the story, obviously. And I feel like it, it's, it's, it, it's, I don't know, it's ha hampering a lot of, it's, it's in some ways very disabling to be a journalist covering this war from, from the outside. But in, in other ways, it's a lot of, I have a lot of respect for all the Gazan journalists, Palestinian journalists inside of Gaza. Uh, they've done a tremendous job covering this war, covering their backyard, you know, mm -hmm. under extremely, extremely difficult circumstances. Um, and and it, I'm, I'm watching in awe from, a far, from far away, but it's, it's also, I'm watching with, with a little bit of fear because like uh, we're seeing the highest amount of uh, journalists getting killed in this war. I mean, I think the numbers are, like you told me, I think up to 95 journalists. 95, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of journalists getting killed in, in one war. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, how are they going to replenish their ranks? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let alone like if I'm a, uh, for, as a photographer, a lot of our profession occupation is based on technology and equipment. I mean, I don't even know how they keep their cameras clean, how they like even like keep it working all the time, like let alone charged and, mm -hmm. you know, send information out, file photos, videos all the time. It's in impossible. I mean, um, I have a colleague who I will not name here um, working inside Gaza, um, who I've worked with since like 2018, mm -hmm. right, working with us. And communicating with her during the war was extremely difficult. I mean, I would see like, you know, we WhatsApp each other and I would see that my messages don't get to her during certain times of the day mm. because there's no power and she, or there's no signal and she has to conserve her power like, you know, because there's not a lot of opportunities to charge her phone. Mm. And at some point of the war, there, just, <coughs> there even wasn't enough uh, gasoline to get car, to drive cars around. So they, a lot of journalists were walking around. Mm -hmm. um, photographers were walking to places. You know, from like that one point they were working out of, some of them at some point were working out of Shifa Hospital. Yeah. Um, so they were walking from there for kilometers just to get to certain places to take, right. you know, do their shoots and then come back. And it's incredibly difficult. I mean, like, no. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, you know, without clean running water, without proper uh, uh, ways to get food, you know, without ways to get. I mean, it's, it's an impossible situation, and they've done an extremely. Uh, uh, astounding job just covering this war from I mean I'm watching every day I mean some of them are still yeah. in there a lot of them have exited fortunately <laughs> but 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 some of them are still in there so yeah I mean I I hope that at some point uh, the IDF will allow international media to go in to at least for the just for the sake of replenishing the ranks you know yeah. just to like help them out you right. know not take over their jobs but at least help them out yeah, we um, uh, um, decided to leave a, a chair empty at the event for um, for our our colleagues um, in 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 Gaza and elsewhere who um, are struggling to do this work under very very difficult circumstances. So, <clears throat> and I think we have a excuse me a video <coughs> um, from the Can committee. You yeah, I'm, unfortunately, it's not helping. It's allergy season which means that this happens sometimes. <gasps> um, <clears throat> so the committee to protect, excuse me, sorry guys, maybe we should cue the video, if you don't. All journalists in Gaza are suffering under the most difficult of circumstances, fuel shortages, food shortages, challenges <laughs> of shelter, bombardment. <laughs> All right, you know. Please take cover. This is my <coughs> local hospital. Inside are my friends, my neighbors. This is my community. Today has been one of the most difficult days in my career. <coughs> we don't have internet, we don't have uh, uh, electricity. We can't call each other, we can't text each other. I lost my battery also. Uh, and we can't charge. Thank you.
<clears throat> so um, the, the committee to protect journalists, um, and I, full disclosure, I'm vice chair of the of the board, and thank you for that lozenge. That really helped. Um, <clears throat> this conflict, uh, 95 journalists have um, have died um, since it began, which is the largest number in, in since any conflict since um, CPJ has been keeping keeping track, which is. Um, you know, in, in the modern era, really quite quite unprecedented. Um, now, what is the um, what is the, um, the 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 challenge? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, we're going to do Q and A at the end, if you don't mind. Mm. So, <clears throat> there has been a tremendous amount of. Um, uh, Questions about why international journalists have not been allowed into into Gaza. Um, uh, CPJ um, um, major news organizations have been have been a requesting for access. Um, um, I thought Noga, maybe you could talk a little bit about your role in 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 pursuing that access, and then also um, um, you know maybe some of the reasons why why that access has not yet happened. I think there are a number of reasons for it. Um, I was part of a lawsuit filed by the Foreign Press Association in Israel on the occupied territories in order to demand access, which failed. Um, why are they doing this? I think, I think there are a lot of reasons, some more interesting than others. Um, I almost wish I could tell you it's because they want to control the narrative. I think that um, Israeli incompetence vis-a-vis -vis understanding what communications means, what the communications array of a sovereign state should look like, should operate like. Um, you know, Israel in some ways is a technologically advanced country and in others is a small provincial country that has always been vulnerable to attack. And, um, for many years, uh, reiterated governments in Israel, all of them led by Netanyahu, uh, who's been prime minister for a very, very long time, made decisions that trickled down eventually into basically all of the institutions of the state that should be operating the major communications or as a foreign ministry the army, mm -hmm. right? So you should never have a, the, the Prime Minister of Israel does not have a spokesperson. Let that sink in. There's no person who has the title. There's no uh, Karine Jean-Pierre. There's no briefings, mm -hmm. okay? So when this attack happened of October 7th, and you know, almost random people who considered themselves expert or who just spoke English volunteered. And so the ridiculousness, the clownishness of this, what ended up happening is that the army does have a spokesperson's unit. And that unit became the spokesperson's, the comms op for the entire country since no one else had one. Mm. And that is one level of the incompetence. The other is that within the army, like within ministries, over time, the job of spokesperson has been deprofessionalized and has become a kind of crony-esque job. I'm speaking in technicalities, but all of this has added up to the current situation. The spokesperson of the Israeli army, who is an admiral called um, Daniel Hagari, who I'm sure most people sitting here have seen on TV at some point, he became the spokesperson of the Israeli army a few weeks before this attack. And that's, this is his first job that has to do with media in his life. Mm. He's a man in his mid-40s. Apparently, he was a very brave Navy SEAL. He knows about media what I know about shoemaking. Right. Well, and, and wait, and he became the top spokesperson for the entire country vis-a-vis -vis the whole world. So in part, these decisions were made as a result of ignorance and incompetence, mm -hmm. not so much out of an evil intent. The result, in my opinion, has been catastrophic. Mm. Well, yeah, Maria, I was going to ask because you've you've um, been on embeds, right? I mean, you worked in Afghanistan. You've done you've been been in a lot of places where, you know, you you navigate and negotiate access um, and and work alongside even in 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 offensive operations. So I, I'd love just to hear you talk about 
you know, both what you think we're missing and then also, you know, how has this worked in other conflicts? I mean, first of all, from, I'll, I'll add to what Noga said, which is from conversations that I've had with like army, you know, army officials, politicians, like a few high level. Feel free to name names. No, no, I, I won't. The, uh, uh, just the, the, to, 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 I won't just for the sake of uh, brevity, but from what I was made to understand, the reason why we're not allowed to go in, uh, A, number one, is the safety of journalists. You know, they right. cite the safety of journalists. Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous for you to go in, you will get killed. Mm -hmm. and, and my argument to them has always been, well, why are you killing the journalists in there? You know, and number two, um, I was made to understand this, is that international journalists do not serve the core constituent of this war. And the core constituent of this war are the Israeli public. Mm -hmm. and, and only the Israeli media serve that constituency. And that's what I was made to understand through these different conversations all across the board. So there's a, there's a sort of two, two part. I mean, one, one thing is, I mean, what's interesting and in that we've had a lot of conversations about this, um, you know, with, with the Committee to Protect Journalists and, and, and others, you know, on this question of why are so many journalists dying? And <clears throat> the reality is that, you know, we often think about journalists dying being like, you know, you sort of run into a war zone and then, and then get, get, you know, sadly killed. You think of somebody like, um, um, <clears throat> uh, Marie Colvin, for example, or, um, you know, there are many historical examples of this. Um, in, in this case, um, these are journalists who are civilians who are living in their homes, uh, doing their jobs also, but um, they're just part of the civilian pop population of Gaza who are experiencing the same thing as, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's interesting that there is this response that, you know, we can't guarantee your safety, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, because, in other conflicts, I think there has been a clear ability to bring, um, you know, international journalists into conflict zones and allowing them safe places to operate because there is a policy of protecting civilians just more broadly, and and journalists are civilians. Um, I mean, I would say look at the example of um, uh, the Palestinian journalist Shireen, who was you know shot and killed. Abu yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and this was pre-October 7th, mm -hmm. and there was uh, an investigation into it, and they found that she was shot by, by, our, uh, by, by the Israeli military, but nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no accountability there and whatsoever, and Shireen was living and working there. Mm -hmm. I mean, she uh, is... Uh, she wasn't living where she was killed. She was she, no, no, on no, the no, job no, in but she's, mm -hmm. she, it, well, she wasn't living in Janine, right? right. But, but she basically was a civilian living in Israel, she lived and, near me in Jerusalem. Right, yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. and worked you know, in the West Bank like everybody, every other journalist that goes into the West Bank. And then it's just, it's hard to, to and in the past, like you know, if I've covered other, in other wars, you know, when we go in embeds, there's a clear protection of journalists mandate, yeah. right? You go in with like, you know, in Iraq, we would go on embeds with the army and the army would do everything they can to protect you, even the Iraqi army, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, and, and, and in Afghanistan, the same thing. You go on the embeds, they do everything they can. You are first priority, like civilians are first priority. Mm -hmm. um, and in this war, I don't know, this is, it's, it's a gray area. I don't know what to make of it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are no conventions that I understand that apply to this war. Mm -hmm. I think we have to, though, delineate some differences. So even, first of all, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, the number, we don't even know the number of Afghani journalists who were killed in that conflict because no one was keeping track. Mm. Okay. Oh, I think CPJ was keeping track, yeah. I don't think we know a real mm. number. Mm. I, in Iraq, I, I think we have better information. Mm -hmm. And the embeds, in every case that I know, um, are protected. Embeds with the Israeli army are also protected. Not all foreign media got it, not all got access. Mm -hmm. You and I didn't. Mm -hmm. I have complained about this vociferously mm -hmm. because they chose. The US Army also chose who they wanted to go in and choose what they show embeds. The, um, to my knowledge, no journalist, foreign or domestic, who has been embedded with the Israeli Army has been harmed in any way. Yep. And I think we have to say something about the reality of Gaza, which I tried to emphasize in my seminar early today. 
part of the tragedy of Gaza started many, many years ago. And the world was silent. The suffering of the people who live in Gaza didn't start on October 7th or 8th. Um, it started much longer ago, but let's begin with the extremely violent takeover by Hamas. Gazan people have been living in a dangerous and authoritarian and arbitrary system and besieged inside that system yeah for a very, very long time. And every interested party, the Gulf states, the state of Israel, Egypt, the Palestinian Authority to whatever extent it did, um, Europe, the UN, the United States, every stakeholder in this region was okay with Hamas building turning Gaza into its own fortress to protect its own power while the people there suffered. Mm. Okay, we, I don't think we should be hiding this. Everyone failed. The, the title of my seminar earlier today was like an array of failure. Mm. Everyone failed. So the, if you talk to completely British and American experts in urban fighting, sit in front of you in the last few weeks, sit in front of me and describe a situation of urban combat in Gaza that no one has ever seen before, that can't be compared to Mosul. And we don't know actually how many people died in Mosul. We have an idea and it's a lot worse than what we've seen in Gaza. So I think we have to put this catastrophe underway now in a perspective of space and time in which this situation was allowed to be built up. The war it didn't emerge like this out of some out of a no context. Mm. And so I think part of the reason so many people are dying is that this, the, the way Hamas managed Gaza was designed so that a maximum amount of people would die. Mm. That's how they protected themselves. They are on the record saying it, even during the war. In one interview that went viral on Saudi TV, a Hamas leader said, was asked by a Saudi journalist, you have all these tunnels, why aren't they bomb shelters for your population? And he replied, the UN could take care of the population, we're taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna start for audience questions in a second, but um, Marcus, you spent um, a, a significant amount of time um, photographing and working in Gaza. I'd love to hear a little bit about your impressions. Um, you know, in, in, uh, there were sort of two separate periods that you spent. Um, mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> the, there was a tremendous amount of violence after the, the right, of return, right to return march. Um, but um, would, would just love, love to hear your impressions, just having spent time there. I mean, it's a, first I'll say the obvious. It's a really small place. It's, an, it's not a very big piece of area. You can traverse it really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, got, I've been very fortunate to have worked with like, some tremendous local journalists uh, drivers, translators um, in Gaza. Um, I saw them, I mean, when I went in there, what struck me the most um, on my first visit was that, you know, they were all struggling. It's very hard to eke out a living there, you know, get food. There's like power shortages all the time. It was not an easy life living in Gaza itself. I mean, on the, and, and the only way you, you'll make a living is if you have language skills and you could work as a translator for like Western media or uh, NGOs or, and all that. Um, I, I found the Gazans, uh, a, you know, there, there were so many levels of society that I could not access, obviously. Like, you know, I, um, I, I've only been able to access what I could see on street level, like, you know, which are Gazans who opened up their homes doors and all that stuff, but I'm sure they were like, many, many layers that I did not see while I was there. Like, you know, I, we would go to like military, military parades sometimes and you know where. Mm. In 2021, I remember going to the, um, the Islamic Jihad military parade where they were like claiming victory and they were like showcasing all their rockets driving through the streets of, open streets of Gaza. And you're like, mm. wow, you can, 
pretty brazen, you know, mm. for them to just show off their guns and all that, and everybody's out on the march. Mm. And, and, and you're just able to photograph that. I'm able to just photograph <laughs> They're it. They're probably very happy for you to <laughs> photograph it. Yeah. I mean, I think they were keeping track of me. They had a minder yeah. on me the entire time. I had a nom de guerre. I could hear them speaking. What was your name. nom de guerre? Uh, they called me Abu Labiba. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I can hear my name on the radio sometimes when I walk past the fighters, like, you know, they were <laughs> announcing where I was mm. to each other. Mm. Um, and, and, and yeah, no, I mean, not, my movement is definitely tracked inside Gaza. Mm -hmm. you know, I go in at the behalf. When we enter Gaza as journalists, you leave Israel at the Erez crossing. You exit Israel, or like, like, you know, like properly exit a country. And you go into Gaza and you have get permission from Hamas to enter and mm. work inside there. Mm. So the Hamas issues you just like paperwork almost. Like you now have permission to work as media mm. inside Gaza, mm. which is a strange thing. It's very formal almost. Mm -hmm. um, and once in there, yeah, you, know, you never know if you're being followed. You know, somebody's always watching you mm. somewhere. And I'm all, my, my, you know, as a photographer, I'm always watching and I'm always paying attention. And I can always see somebody on their phone looking at your car, driving past, and then you just like pick up the phone and just like make a phone call. <laughs> it's like the movies, like it feels like the movies. You're like, yep, that's a spotter, that's a spotter, that's a spotter. Um, so, I mean, I can do the stories I can do. Like in, in the Right to Return March, I only focused on the stories that mattered, which was like the people protesting and how they were uh, 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 maimed and, 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 in, and, and shot. Uh, for the, the purpose of maiming them, basically. So mo a lot of them had to be amputated after the protests, you know, mm -hmm. the ones that were shot and still survived. Um, and most of them were young men who could not, obviously, were the sole breadwinners of their families. So after being mm -hmm. maimed, they could not really provide for their families anymore. So what happened to them? So mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, and the hospitals during that period of protests in 2018 were under an enormous amount of stress already, right? And they already had, Lack of medical supplies, lack of you know sometimes lack of doctors in certain mm. uh, divisions, and and I remember doing a story about a guy who who was getting uh, uh, for going through the amputation process, and it's a procedure. I and mean, they would rather amputate quickly and just move, just get this person out of the hospital as fast as possible instead of like actually giving a chance for you know his foot to heal. Mm. Mm. And I think we're seeing that in this war now. Uh, and we're hearing stories of people like, you know, who are uh, injured or survived like a bombing, an, an Israeli airstrike, and then like, you know, um, a shrapnel or something hit their leg or a, a limb. And then you see the Gazan doctors just wanting to amputate as fast as possible yeah. so they can like move, move people through the, the wards basically and not have a backlog of people. Mm. Um, I was just recently in Doha to check on my Gazan colleague who, you know, uh, who evacuated uh, out of Gaza, and 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 they were living in this compound at the uh, behest of the Qatari government, basically. And in there, I saw hundreds of children. Like you know, uh, most of them were injured, uh, injured from the war. So there were children just running around. It felt very dystopian. And this was housing made for the World Cup that was never used. Wow. So, and hundreds of children, you know, some of them are amputated, some of them on a wheelchair, some of them in casts, like, mm -hmm. you know, just running around, some of them wearing like Disney princess clothing, and they're being children, and they have bubble guns, they have, yeah. you know, soccer <laughs> balls, and you're like, what is going on here? Yeah. You know, and most of them were injured, really just really for being children, they were mostly playing outside, you know, you can't mm. blame children, um, they weren't, you know, and... And it's hard, it's very, you know, it's heartbreaking to see all that and listen to the stories their parents would tell us, like, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I digress, but like, it's very difficult to, 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 to see that and know all that is going on. I think one of the things I want to, to point out is, is on top of that, the, Anyways, I should stop right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to give people a chance yeah. to ask questions, so please, um, yeah, there's some, there's some mic, there's a mic right here. If you can just line up um, and uh, to ask your questions. Um, um, also, I know this is a very emotional subject. We're going to do our best. We're journalists up here to answer your questions to the best of our knowledge, um, but um, obviously, we're we're not we're not decision makers. So, um, yes, please. 
Hi, my name is Revati and I'm a MPP student, a public policy student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, as journalists, uh, how do you think, um, how would you view the concept of international solidarity for journalists in Gaza um, who really don't have the option of, let's say, not showing gore? And as journalists also associated with established, um, you know, news organizations like the New York Times and LA Times, how can we ensure there's more accountability for the lives lost of, of journalists? For those who, let's say, can't ensure the accountability, um, if either one of you want to answer that. I mean, in terms of uh, international solidarity, I think I assure you, I think there is a sense of international sol solidarity for all our fellow brethren, like, you know, who are killed in this war. I mean, I, I know some, some I have some friends who are amongst those who are killed, and it's, I don't take this lightly, uh, and none of us do. I think it's like, you know, journalism is like a big tribe, you know, and when I meet a fellow journalist anywhere in the world, we immediately bond, we connect, like, you know, there's like nothing like it. I may not know anything about this person, where they're from, but like, I know we are, you know, cut from the same cloth. We have the same rules, you know, we, we live the same, almost the same way in terms of our work. So. Um, and in terms of like what we can do for accountability is to continue to report and that's all it is I mean there's nothing it feels like in this war uh, we have we have the CPJ to thank for keeping track of the casualties for sure um, and it's hard for us to keep track of it uh, without more resources on the ground without going in there to verify things because there's only that much we can do from like watching this, you know, news being reported on social media. And we can't really, like I don't repost anything that I can't verify. Mm -hmm. Like when I see videos coming out, you know, online and all that from Gaza, from the West Bank, as inflammatory as it is, or as crazy as it sounds like, I need to like make sure everything is double checked, triple checked, like, cause I don't know where it's from. For all I know, it's a deep fake, you know, like we don't know, um, unless, you know, reputable outlets like Al Jazeera, the New York Times, the Washington Post, like mm -hmm. post it, you know, publishes it, then we can share those things. Associated Press. Associated Johnson Press also, press, yeah. like, yeah. 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 I just want to point out that Al Jazeera has made some pretty bad mistakes during this war. Even the New York Times, which I admire, has made some bad mistakes. So even media, um, British media, the BBC has made, I don't know how many apologies, and not apologize for others. It's been a really complicated, difficult um, a, a situation to verify. And, and in addition to the deep fakes, there's also intentional propaganda put out there. So you're kind of swimming in a sea where if you didn't take the picture and you weren't there or you didn't speak to the person, it's, it's very, very, very dangerous. And I think we all have to be incredibly careful. And this is the problem why, uh, of, and why we sh international why we should media be in should be in That's there. That's what I was getting to. You know, without being in there, we can't verify certain Not things. Not like allowing journalists in, in my opinion, one, I said it ended and has caused a catastrophe. One small aspect of that catastrophe is that it has, it has allowed conspiracy theories um, nefarious propaganda, intentional deepfakes, and all of this world of crap that pretends to be journalism to flourish because we don't have eyes and ears on the ground saying, I was there. Right. Yeah. It's a disaster. It's yeah. one of the disasters of this policy. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, Hi, thank you for sharing your experiences and your opinions. Uh, I was, my question is, uh, previously you have shared the challenges of journalism uh, by, uh, by org kind of organized systems such as a, a state or kind of a re local regime. I was wondering what, it, what are the challenges and what's your opinion on like, uh, dealing with these challenges when you're operating in the front lines where due to the last lack, of, uh, lack of management or lack of the poli local policing, there might be also uh, kind of uh, less organized spontaneous uh, challenges like crimes so or like uh, either theft or burglaries, or maybe even kidnapping to journalists that was selling in there. How do you think journalism, uh, how, how could you, how do you see, how do you handle with such kind of challenges? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking about some of my, I mean, so I've, I've actually never reported from Israel or Palestine. So I'm this, uh, I spent a whole career uh, essentially avoiding the Middle, Middle East for a variety of reasons, but I have spent a lot of time in places like, 
you know, the Congo or, um, you know, places that are, or Darfur in Sudan, places where there is a tremendous amount of chaos where, you know, control and, you know, warlordism and things like that and colleagues who've worked in places like Somalia, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious for, for both of you, working in those kinds of environments where, where authority is not clear and where you actually, there isn't anybody that can really vouch for your, for your safety. Um, uh. That's, I mean, I can only speak to the most recent thing, at least for now. I mean, in, it, like in terms of like crime, and I think I never worried about crime so much when I was working in this war, uh, whether or not be in Israel or in the West Bank. Uh, probably because Israel is the most like heavily, uh, it's a big surveillance state. Mm -hmm. Nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you will not. Nobody will run away with anything basically with so many cameras around. Like, I mean, I, I think they're inside the old city of Jerusalem, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the old ancient city, there, there are probably more cameras in there. I, I wonder if there are more cameras in there in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. per se. You know, like they were able to like, are, they are able to pick out people going to pray on Friday that were told last week they can't come back. Mm -hmm. Like people in the crowds just mingling in, you know, they were able to pick that guy out. It's like, you, you know, pull him out. And I was like, how did they find him? Like of, out of like thousands of people streaming in is surveillance, you know, the mm. facial recognition. And even in the West Bank, like every turn you make, every like, you know, a couple hundred meters, every kilometer is like there are cameras mm -hmm. pointing us at the cars. They're registering our license plate. They're registering our fa face in the car. So they can keep track of us, like where we go in the West Bank, like mm. they know everything. Mm. And now with the, the, um, the rise of AI and, you know, um, and, and I, I can't even imagine like the amount of uh, uh, control they have over this information. You can plug in like, you know, based on my trajectory and how, where I've been in the West Bank, they can figure out where I'm going next. Mm you know, mm -hmm. based on the pattern, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, that's, that's dystopian and, and sort of terrifying. <clears throat> I would always tell my mother when I'd go to a war zone yeah. that as a statistical matter, I was more likely to be killed in a car accident. Um, yeah. which, is, which is actually, I mean, I, I joke, but I mean, it's actually true. I mean, one of, my, one of my closest friends, who's, you know, one of the most famous war photographers in the world, the, the closest that she ever came to dying in a, in, in, on assignment was, was actually in a very, very bad car crash. Um, and, you know, she was like kidnapped in Libya and, um, you know, like has had lots of really, really terrible experiences, but that was the, the most, um, the most uh, you know, yeah. closest, to, closest to death, so. I, I think so. so, I mean, like even in the West Bank, I, I'll answer the, sec the second part, in the West Bank, like I never worried about petty crime and all that stuff and lawlessness and all that, yeah. like, like even working inside the refugee camps in like different cities, like the, 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 the militia, the fighters, whoever, you, whatever you call them or that are in charge, you know, they, when you're in that zone, you're, they you're part of their protection. You're part yeah. of their protection. Yeah. Like it's a yeah. weird, like on a code almost like it's strange. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Like nothing will happen to you unless they say so. Yeah. I mean the culture of hospitality, right? That, yeah. um, that, you know, when someone invites you into their community. So it's, it's interesting. Yes, please. Yeah. Do you have a, a perception of what the sentiment is on the Israeli side mm -hmm. and on the Palestinian civilian side about how this ends? It's mm. a big <laughs> question. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll say uh, there are a number of things. The Palestinian Authority is being much more responsive for all of its flaws, and it has them, is being much more responsive and much more forward thinking thus far than the Israeli government. So the Palestinian president, who is 80-something and pretty decrepit, changed his entire government just recently. a little more than a month ago? Yeah, recently. Mm -hmm. New prime minister, entire new mechanism, new people, and designed to be a structure more palatable um, to the United States and to the Gulf states, to the principal foreign stakeholders, so that they're preparing to take over in Gaza, which I want to see as a positive thing. I don't know, you know, I, my sense among both Israelis and Palestinians right now 
is one of real despair. I, I'm not sure anybody sees an endpoint right now, and there's so many ways that the current situation could still get worse, um, and might, and might not, but might. The Israeli government, for internal political reasons, is simply refusing, or is incapable, I don't know, whatever you want to say, to contemplate an end point. The, I'm going to repeat something I already said this morning. I think it's very important. The Prime Minister of Israel, whose support among his voters is at about 20%, has said in public that if elections were brought forth, it's a parliamentary system, his government could be toppled, he could be forced into new elections. He said that if that happens, that will be a victory for Hamas. And that's what something close to 80% of Israelis are asking for. So the government is refusing to contemplate what it views as its own demise. Um, and, you know, you see how, how that looks. And then now, of course, you know, with Iran, you know, firing missiles and that's, you know, things, things I mean, get more complicated. It is more complicated. So, but, you know, Iran was part of this from day one. The weaponry that was used by Hamas. Hamas couldn't have done this without Iran. No, Hamas used Iranian weapons yeah. and its most elite fighters were trained by Iran mm -hmm. to do this. So this is definitely a major step up. And, and I think principally the threat is to countries beyond Israel. If, mm. if Iran can shoot suicide drones, hundreds of suicide drones at Israel, it can do it at London. That's the message behind all this, yeah. okay? It's a message of asserting power. It can do it to Saudi Arabia. Why did Saudi Arabia participate in the uh, array of nations stopping this Iranian attack Saturday night? It's because they know the message to them. Yeah. Um, but we were asked what the people feel. I think people across the board right now are feeling a kind of despair. Mm. Mm. I agree. I mean, I think every, everybody I've talked to, um, especially in the West Bank, uh, Palestinians are feeling like this war, this is just the beginning of the war. This is not even, we're not even at the end yet. And this is the start of, you know, a very, very, very long war. Yeah, in, in my conversations with, with, with people, they describe on, on both sides feeling like they're being held hostage. Um. That was the headline of my piece marking six months of yeah. this war, yeah. was that Netanyahu is holding Israelis and Palestinians hostage. Well, and Hamas is holding Palestinians hostage. Mm -hmm. Hamas, it's one of its principal tenets is to hold Palestinians hostage. But the reason I keep bringing this up is everybody knew it. Mm -hmm. Everyone who has an interest in this region knew it. And we allow this to happen over a period of 17 or 18 years. Mm. And I think we should not let those people, those governments, those individuals who have held power all these years off the hook so lightly about how we let this happen. Hamas is not all powerful. Mm. It became this powerful. And people knew it. Yeah. Please. Yep. We got time for one, one more. Yeah. Following the maxim, never let a crisis go to waste, uh, isn't, uh, isn't it possible that exactly the horrible situation you present would be a catalyst to uh, holding people to account and uh, bringing about some, uh, well, two state solution, for example? Or is it the case that uh, this is actually part of a bigger world war thing that? Uh, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea, China uh, are in a kind of alliance. And so uh, the breaking out of war in uh, Gaza uh, uh, leads people like J.D. Vance in the U.S. Congress to say, well, we can't provide arms to Ukraine. We have to provide them to Israel. So th there could be method to this madness uh, that it actually is a, 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 a sound rational strategy on the part of, uh, well, Russia, Iran, and so on. So uh, is it an opportunity, or is it uh, the beginning of war calamity? 
And I also <laughs> was going to ask, uh, I was actually going to ask, it's so astounding to hear you say that Netanyahu doesn't have a press secretary. Does that mean that he regards his policy as inarticulable or indefensible? Or <laughs> like even Baghdad, even Saddam Hussein had Baghdad Bob and <laughs> Putin has Dmitry Peskov to articulate an official doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> so with the absence of a doctrine, that, that itself would be worth uh, some investigative journalism to <laughs> yeah. find out why. Yeah. Um, Netanyahu considers himself above the media, that he considers trashy riffraff. Mm, mm. Um, I think the answer to your complicated question is yes. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are opportunities here. I think we see the United States government attempting to try and direct things in that direction. I think it is possible that something good will eventually emerge from the current catastrophe. But I think, yes, it's evident that we're in a period of very dangerous, very violent global alliances. The same suicide drones that were launched at Israel Saturday night and that may be launched again have been launched against Ukrainian civilians every single day. They're the same Iranian drones used by Russia. I don't know if you remember, we were so shocked under two years ago to hear, oh my God, Iranian suicide drones, Iranian missiles are being aimed at these Ukrainian cities at Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're in a period of very nefarious global alliances. And all of this, all of your questions are in the air. I mean, it's possible that, I mean, with, with the amount of U.S. involvement in this war and the amount of U.S. involvement in Ukraine war, the U.S. now is, is strung out, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in two separate conflicts. I mean, it's funny because the end of Afghanistan and that forever war, I, when I walked out of that, I thought, finally, we're at we're done with wars, like America's done with wars. Like, at least Middle East wars. Yeah. At least Middle East, like yeah. just war, like active wars in yep. general, right? Yep. I thought we were done with that, but then obviously Ukraine came and then this came and then now we're back in it again in full swing. Um, so we are in some ways tied. I don't know, I can't see the bigger picture because I'm like too deep in it. I'm sort of in the hornet, you know, the eye of the storm as they say. So I can't really see what's going on on, on the global scale. I do know that like, um, you know, what happened uh, on Saturday was definitely unprecedented uh, in the sense of like, I've never seen like, you know, drones launched from Iran to Israel. No one has ever seen no it. No one's ever seen No, no. <laughs> but that to say, I mean, those drones are not flying very, very fast. I mean, it's top, the Shahid drone top speed is, is they 100. They came with cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. It wasn't just the drones. Correct, yes, yeah. but the drones were interceptable. They were right. very, very slow, and they were alerted to the drones. And well telegraphed, right? Yeah, I mean, the right, US, right. you know, they clearly, clearly wanted, wanted, wanted the, the world to know that they were coming. Um, it's very hard to know. I mean, um, you know, every crisis creates opportunities, and um, I am an inveterate optimist. So yeah, I'm not sure who's right. gaining from this. All yeah. I know is, like, when this war started, I know the biggest winners are, are in some some winners are like the arms the, the arms manufacturers. Always. You know, Raytheon, Always. Raytheon the <laughs> the company that is involved in the. Uh, what do you call the, the defense? The Iron Dome. The Iron Dome, the yeah. production of the Iron Dome yeah. parts, basically. Yeah. Their stocks jump. Iron Dome is just defensive, let's say. Yeah, just yeah. defensive. You know, yeah. They've announced uh, after the war that they were going to open a manufacturing plant in a mm. new state. Mm. You know, and their, the value of their stocks just rose dramatically yeah. you know, since and that war. And I want to say that Ukraine has been begging for Iron Dome technology for almost two years and mm -hmm. has been denied it, mm. reportedly by Israel at the beginning and now by Republicans. Yeah. And it's, it's purely defensive technology. Yeah. Well, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Um, Marcus Noga, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, thank you. Conversation.